face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. In every prayer we prayed in desperation, the songs of faith we sang through doubt and see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears. There will be a day where all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And on that day, we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. With one voice, a thousand generations sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Forever he shall reign. There will be a day when all will bow before him. with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord, so let it be today. We shout the hymn of heaven with angels and the saints. We raise a mighty Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we lift up all those going to uh, West Coast Grace Youth Camp. Pray that it can be a time that people learn about you who haven't heard about you. And we pray that it can be a time that's uplifting and encouraging to your people. A time when they're able to learn more about you, to better share your word with those who don't know you yet. And God, we thank you for today. In your name, amen. You may seat. You may take your seats. <laughs> well, I'm very glad that you are joining us this morning. It is a little bit of a different morning, as we've been mentioning. We do have a lot of those that are on their way to West Coast Grace Youth Camp. But as you guys are here, we just want to welcome you. If you're visiting with us this morning, we do have a couple of ways we want to connect with you. We can connect with you if you scan the QR code. There is a connection card that you can fill out online. If you do not want to do that, you can also meet with us at the blue table on your way out just to kind of get some information about who we are as a church and what we are about and ask us any questions that is available for you. Uh, but the big announcement, as we've been mentioning, is the uh, all of those that are heading to West Coast Grace Youth Camp, uh, for all of us here, this is a opportunity, and I want to invite you to be praying for them this week. If you are a part of our church and you have already kind of let us know about like being interested in hearing all the different communications, we will be sending out emails throughout this week. There has already been one email sent this morning just saying, here's what we can pray for those that are going to be at the camp. We did have about 
think it's over 90 that have kind of come from our church that are heading out towards uh, that direction. So you can be praying for their safe travels this this morning because they're gonna they're still on their trip, as well as just uh, all of the different. Well, I guess as they arrive, getting settled in and then really being ready to learn and to be challenged in God's word. Also be praying for those that don't know who Christ is yet, that they can make a decision during this week. But those are the really the big announcements. Um, so as we pray for this morning's offering, I want to pray for those that are heading towards camp, that are, will be at camp, the counselors that are going to be at camp. Um, as we do give for this morning's offering, we don't pass the plate, but we do have a box in the back that you can uh, put any of your donations as well as giving online. Uh, it's up to what your heart will decide. But let's pray for this morning's offering. We will also pray for those that are heading to the camp. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this morning that we get to come and worship you um, this no matter how many are here, we, we are so thankful that we get to worship you freely in this nation. Uh, we, we pray that you would um, be a part of um, our giving, that we would be wanting to do this out of a joyful and a grateful heart that we can worship you. And we also pray that these resources would be used wisely. We think of one of those resources that we're spending really with camp, that we, uh, I just pray that you would keep all of those that are heading towards Palomar safe, whether they're from our church or they're from other churches, keep them safe on the road, help them not feel uh, too car sick. And if there's, uh, we just pray that there would be no air conditioning problems as well. We know that that's kind of a real thing here. Uh, we just pray that also that when they arrive at camp, the students would enjoy each other's company and fellowship, that they would also be challenged to grow in their walk with you. And if they've not put their faith in you, that they would be um, able to see you and hear of your love, that they can make a decision um, to follow you. We also pray for the counselors as they're heading. Um, I pray that you would help them with um, being able to get sleep, and if they don't have enough sleep, that you would sustain them through the lack of sleep. I pray that they would take opportunities that are available and in front of them to be able to challenge and talk to the students that they have. We pray, th pray that their lives would just be encouraged. We also just pray um, for our church that you would continue to encourage us. Pray for Pastor Josh as he presents the, the word this morning, that we would be able to be challenged and apply this to our lives. We just thank you um, so much for your love. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, up through second grade, you are dismissed for Children's Church. Well, just really quick, I want to thank Brian Clark for leading us in worship. And the reason I want to thank him is because he is now our new worship director as of January 1st. And he stayed behind. He's actually going to camp, but now it's his responsibility. So he stayed behind led us in worship, and right after this, he's going to load up his keyboard. He's going to head over to Palomar as well. So, Brian, very thankful that you were able to do that. Yeah, if you go ahead. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. And one other, one other quick announcement before we get into the message for today. Um, I, I got in contact, or I was contacted by uh, some of the missionaries that we uh, support here at the church, John and Naomi Caprari. Uh, it's been a few years since they've been to our church. They've been in Africa. And John is going to be here this, this week and the only time that he had available to meet with people in our church or some of the people that give is Wednesday. And so this, went, uh, this is short notice. So if anyone who would like to talk to John and Naomi and just kind of have an update, we're going to meet in the multipurpose center at 7 a.m. on Wednesday. 7 a.m. The main reason 7 a.m. is because some of you might have to work and it gets hot. So we wanted to kind of beat the heat. But if you would like to, there's coffee, there'll be some pastries, and we'll meet with John and Naomi Caprari. I think J Naomi will be there. Uh, but that, yeah, just kind of a random way to do this, but he wanted to make sure that he was able to see people in our church that wanted to, to speak with him. All right, that's it for the announcements. Um, it's good to be back in Arizona. It's kind of weird to say that. I, we go to Michigan for a couple weeks, but it's, it's actually be good to be back. Um, like I always say on these trips, it's good to go, and it's good to return, right? Vacations should be like that. And only going back to Michigan once a year, it really kind of makes you how fast life goes by. And especially we got nieces and nephews, and, and um, back there in Michigan, they grow them different. <laughs> so, so we go back there, and Kristen comes from the, the land of giants, uh, the Netherlands. They're all really tall. And every time we see her nephews, I guess they're my nephews too, they're like this. They keep growing, and Ephraim was like really tall. So it's kind of, wow, there, there they go. 
And what we do is we usually stay in the house that Kristen grew up in, and now um, her parents bought a different place, but her brother lives there. And for the last decade or 15 times that we've been there, we'll go there and we have like 13 people camping out in a four-bedroom, two-bath house with no central air conditioning. And it's wonderful and chaotic all at the same time. And the kids, you know, especially when they were younger, they, they stay up really late at night. The sun doesn't really go down until about 10 o'clock at night. And there's the fireflies, and you stay up really late. And then, because we're on vacation, we sleep in really late, and that's, that's kind of fun. And, but now, it seems like those days are kind of gone. Um, not everyone is able to go on these trips. Our boys are getting older. Their boys are getting older. And in fact, Kyle, this is the first year Kyle, my son, was not able to go. Uh, he was up in Washington with his girlfriend, Erica. Hi, Erica, if you're watching. And, and her older brother, Erica's older brother, got married, and so Kyle was able to be one of the groomsmen in the wedding, so he was able to go there. So it was different. It was definitely different without Kyle there at the house. And, and Caleb is a working man. Uh, he took one week off from work, and he flew down, and he was there. So it's just kind of different. And, and their two oldest boys, um, Kristen's brother, Mark, and their two oldest boys, they're older now and they're working and they're driving, so it was a little bit different. But, you know, you go back there once a year and it's just like this reminder that it doesn't stop. Life just keeps going and it's not going to stop. And like I, I mentioned before, I, as much as I look forward to going, I especially miss my bed in my own house. You know how that is? In fact, we st I stayed in a blow-up air mattress, and all throughout the night, it lost air. <laughs> so every day I wake up, and it's like, oh, that was not fun. And I, I woke up every morning, and I thought to myself, I'm too old for this. <laughs> I want my bed. But we're grateful. We're really grateful. I bring this up because this does kind of deal with the message a little bit. It's, it's great that we have an opportunity to go back and maintain those relationships. Those are important relationships, family and friends. And even though we live in Phoenix, I mean, this is our life. You know, this is our church family. This is, this is where we live. It's nice that we've had the hope of once a year going back and seeing family and friends. I know that's true for us. And I know if you live here in Phoenix, chances are you probably have people who live somewhere else. And you look forward to those times, whether it's during the summer, if you can get out of the heat or if Christmas time or whenever you want to go see those family members, those friends, and those relationships, and it's so important to keep those going. But we all know in this life, for a variety of reasons, people come into our life, people leave our life for a wide variety of reasons. But relationships are what life is about, our relationship with each other and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, we are in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. We're making progress. And Paul used the fourth chapter of Thessalonians to talk about God's will. So for the last, basically the month of June, we were talking about God's will. And we looked at how Paul says that it's God's will for us. If you want to know what God's will, this is what God's will is. It's God's will that we be sanctified. In other words, that we be holy, that we are slowly being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And then Paul spent one section talking about how the Thessalonians were not being sanctified, they were not being holy, and that was their practice in sexual immorality, so he warns them about those things. And then three weeks ago, before we left on our trip for vacation, we talked about the section where it says, how we're to live as we're waiting for the return of Jesus Christ, which is today. Okay, we're gonna, we, no, the return isn't today, but the, the section is, is today. No, you never know. But how we are to live, and there was four things. As we're waiting for Christ, we are to love the brotherhood. We are to lead a quiet life. We are to mind our own business. That's kind of fun to say every now and then. Mind your own business, but that, talking about focusing on our responsibilities and to have an excellent work ethic because when we have a good work ethic, it is truly a, a, a testimony. And this next section that we're dealing with today is the future event referred to as the rapture. This is our next passage. Now, before we get into this, and I'll have the slides up there and you can follow along in your own Bible, there are a couple different ways that we can go through this passage couple different ways I could preach this passage. The first way is kind of from a technical standpoint. You know, we're talking about future events, and I'm doing a Sunday school class on this. It's kind of fun to look at the details, look at the supporting passages, and say this is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and the order of events, and it's almost impossible to not do a little bit of that, and we'll do a little bit of that today. So there's a technical way to approach this. 
But Paul, his primary concern was not teaching them the technical aspects of this future event. His concern, and the way we're going to kind of approach this today, is from, from an emotional standpoint. He was sharing with them about this future event because they were emotionally grieving for their lost loved ones that had already passed away. And in chapter 5, which we'll get to in the coming weeks, Paul does get technical about some future events, and we'll, we'll do that when we get there. But for today, what I want us to do is to just allow the truth of this event to fill us with hope and comfort as Paul intended this for the Thessalonians. So let's go ahead and read our passage for today. First, Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. He says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so the reason why Paul wrote this to the Thessalonians is because they were, they were uninformed. They didn't know what to expect and why this was going to take place. And Paul, as, as Paul writes us, it's obvious that he has spent time talking to them about these different future events. And this is, this is quite remarkable. The Thessalonians were, had only been believers for a short period of time. I mean, we're talking maybe just a few months. They had just learned that Jesus is the Messiah. They learned, maybe some of them, if they had no Jewish background, they had learned everything from scratch. And Paul talked to them about Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, how they should be living their lives, talking about future events, and, and in all that they had learned, these future events, it's kind of hard for them to keep straight. Kind of, they were kind of muddy and, and confused and a little bit foggy in their brain. And future events are hard to keep straight because they haven't happened yet. You know, future events are kind of hard to, to figure out. But here Paul is addressing some of their concerns. And in this passage we realize, since Paul had left them in just the few months that he had been with them, some of them had died. Some of their brothers and sisters in Christ had died. And they were concerned about what is going to happen to them in light of these future events. And so these Thessalonians wondered, will my loved ones who have died, are they going to miss out on the return of Christ? They might have had questions like, when are they, if they died, when are they going to get their resurrected bodies? And will it be at the same time? Is it going to be later? And will there be any kind of a distinction between us who are alive when Christ returns and those who have died? And so all of these thoughts that they had were causing a lot of confusion and some concern. And so Paul writes to them to give them some clarity, some comfort, and really he's giving them some hope. And so like I mentioned already, in the next section, starting next week when we get into chapter 5, we're going to get technical on the order of events. But for day, today, let's just embrace the hope of the rapture, okay? This future event is to give us hope. And if you got your notes, I'm going to actually give you all three points right now, and then we're going to go through them one by one. But as we read this passage, we realize our hope in the rapture is found in these three things. The first is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The second thing, and we'll go through this slower, don't worry. The second thing is the participants of the rapture. Our hope is found in who's going to be participating. And the third thing is the plan. There's clearly a plan here. So let's begin. Let's go back to the first point. So the first point is this. The first reason why we have hope is because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Because Jesus died and rose from the dead, this future event gives us hope. Let's read that from verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. It says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus... 
God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The reason why we have the hope in the future is because Jesus died and rose again. And because Jesus died as a perfect, sinless human being, our sins are paid for. Amen? It's good news, right? That's why we're here, to celebrate that. And Jesus' death satisfied God's demands of righteousness and holiness and justice. And his death fully paid for the full penalty of our sins. And so Jesus, we talk about this in this terms. He was our substitutionary atonement. He satisfied God's wrath as our substitute. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reiterates this, about how Jesus' death pays for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, he made him, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so today, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are the righteousness of God. And now believers have been made acceptable to God, and we are now fit to be gathered into God's presence someday at this event. And even better yet, not only did Jesus die, but God raised him back to life. And what God did for Jesus, he says he will do for everyone who has genuine faith in Christ. Jesus is referred to in the New Testament, especially by Paul, as the first fruits of the dead. He's the first one. And so you, what is a first fruit? That's not a word that we often use. But a first fruit is the first evidence of more that is to come. Okay? Usually in an agrarian society, they're talking about the harvest or uh, fruit that's grown on a tree. As soon as you see that first bud and you pick that first fruit, it's the first fruit. It's the first of more to come. Let's read a few passages that confirm that Jesus is the first fruits of the dead. And because he rose from the dead, we will too. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 20. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Then it is coming, those who belong to Christ. And we're reading this and we're sitting this, and this was a long time, written a long time ago, but this is talking about us. This is referring to us and what's going to happen to us in the future. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. It says, And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. You know, it's easy to read this as, as words that Paul wrote to somebody else, but this is to us. God is going to raise you up by his power. First, 2 Corinthians 4, 14. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. All of these are talking about the event that we're talking about today. So Jesus is the first of everyone who will be resurrected. He is the first fruits. You know, we have a whole bunch of kids, hundreds of kids ascending the, the mountain of Palomar in California. And I know that the staff of Palomar are trembling in fear. Probably, no, maybe not trembling in fear. But as they see that first van or that first bus pull up and kids just spilling off the bus, they're like, here they come. They're the first fruits. There's more behind them. Listen, we're talking about the resurrection. Our resurrection was part of God's plan. It's always been God's plan. God created you and me as eternal beings. God created us to live forever. And in order for us to live in, in his presence, a sacrifice needed to be made to pay for our sins. And just as God raised Jesus back to life, God's plan is to raise all of us back to life and to give us a glorified body that will live for eternity. So this is our hope. This is our hope. That's why this event gives us this hope, all right? Second reason why we have hope in the rapture is because of who is going to participate. The Bible tells us who is going to be part of this future event. Let's read verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, it says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, 
who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So you read this, this is very clear. There are two groups of people who are going to participate in this event known as the rapture. Those who have fallen asleep, and this is talking about physical death, okay? Those who have physically died and those who are alive. And everyone here in this room, we're alive, so there's still hope, right? That we might be part of that second group. You never know. But as you read this, you can tell that, um, you read the, the New Testament, especially Thessalonians and some of these other the books, they thought Christ was going to return pretty quick. In fact, it brought this up, and we'll probably bring this up again um, in, when we get to 2 Thessalonians. Some of these Thessalonians got so excited about the return of Christ, they thought he was going to come at any moment. So what'd they do? They quit their jobs. They went to their boss and said, uh, sorry, I'm not even giving you two weeks. Jesus is coming back. I'm done. That was a mistake, all right? They shouldn't have done that. And, and Paul chastises them for this. And, and within the last several decades here in the world, there has been um, a significant amount of increased attention on the rapture, this event. And of course, why not? It's something that we hope for. And as soon as Israel was reestablished as a, as a nation in 1948, there's a prophecy that talks about since such and such a time, there's going to be a generation. And people have been thinking, the rapture is going to happen. The rapture is going to happen at any moment. And, and we know um, that anyone who has guessed when the rapture was going to take place has been wrong, okay? So here's the deal. We do not know precisely when this will happen. And people have been guessing and predicting dates for a long time. The details have been not revealed to us for very good reason. But what we do know, we don't know when, but we know who. We know who will participate in this. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you will experience this event. This is going to happen to us someday in the future. Let's read a little bit more, some of the technical details about this event from 1 Corinthians 15. So 1 Corinthians 15. It says, verse 50, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, we need a new body. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So here, another one of the verses that talk about the rapture, we learn that when the trumpet sounds, the souls of believers who have already died are going to be reunited with a resurrected, glorified body. And for any of us who are lucky enough to be still alive, our bodies are going to instantly change into a resurrected, glorified body. And according to these passages, it sounds like the dead in Christ, they're, they're going to experience this maybe first by like just like a, a fraction of a second. So you read these things, and this is an event that hasn't happened yet, right? And we're like, wow, what is this going to be like? So I want to stop right here for a second. And I don't know if you've ever really spent time thinking about this. And by thinking, I, I kind of mean daydreaming. Like, have you ever daydreamed about what it will be like when you experience the rapture? Of course, when you daydream, you're probably thinking about still being alive, right, D during the rapture. But as I do this, and sometimes I do this, and I have had a chance to do this this week, especially with this being the message, a little honesty, it's both exciting, maybe that's an understatement, and a little terrifying. And by terrifying, I just mean this is going to be something that we experience that is so, so very different than anything we've ever experienced in our life. It's like, what, what is it going to be like? And there are so many details surrounding this event that all of us just want to know. But like many of these things in the Bible that we don't fully understand, they're, like I say, they're above our pay grade. Okay. God tells us what we need to know, not what we want to know. But we do know this. This will happen to everyone who has faith in Jesus. Everyone whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life will experience this moment that Paul is describing. And once this happens, this is the good news. We get to say goodbye to all the physical problems that we've ever faced in this life. Amen? I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the hope. That's what really gives us a lot of hope. So that's the second thing. Who will participate? The third reason 
why we have hope in the rapture is because of the plan. Here in 1 Thessalonians and also 1 Corinthians and a couple other passages, there's kind of some details about this event which re reveals to us that this is, as we refer to as an appointed time. This is an appointed time that God has planned the exact timing and nature of this event before the foundation of the world. This is going to happen exactly when God has planned for it to happen. And with such an important event that's going to have a wonderful eternal impact on those who are participants of this event, it is going to have a devastating impact on the people who are left here on earth when we are gone. More on that in the weeks to come. This will kind of come up in some of the next messages. But here Paul shares what he knows about the plan. These things are going to take place. You can call them like five steps or five stages. So let's read this. Verse 16. Verse 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So here are five things that are included in the plan. Now, we might not know the entire plan, but we know at least these five things. And it starts with this. Number one is Jesus himself coming back for us. Okay, and there's a distinction that needs to be made in this passage compared to what we know is going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we at our church, we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. We believe that the rapture and the second coming are two different events. And this is one of the distinctions that leads us to that conclusion. At the second coming of Jesus, Jesus will come all the way back down to earth. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. It's one of the Old Testament prophecies. And Jesus will stay on earth defeat Satan at the Battle of Armageddon, and he will stay and establish the thousand-year millennial kingdom here on earth. Here in this passage, it says he will descend in the clouds. We will meet him in the air, and then we know what happens next is we go up and we're with Christ in heaven until the tribulation is over. So this starts with Jesus descending in the clouds to meet us in the air. Second thing, along with Jesus descending, is there is a cry of command. And the word for command is kelusuma, kelusuma, and it has a military ring to it, okay? It's as if like a commander is calling his troops to stand in line, okay? So this cry of command will have authority, it'll have purpose, and whatever is said, and I'm assuming that this is Christ is going to say the command, you wonder if he's going to say, get in line or get ready or, you know, whatever he's going to say. But there's going to be a command that's going to have authority and it's going to have purpose. And whoever he's commanding, they're going to do exactly what he says to do. So there will be a cry of command. Along with the cry of command is going to be the voice of the archangel. And this appears to be separate from the cry of command. And the, the one archangel that is mentioned in the Bible goes by the name of Michael. So maybe Michael apparently has some kind of role or function within this event. And I don't know if he's going to give a command as a well or well, but whatever he's going to do. The fourth thing that's going to happen is, after the voice of the archangel, there will be the trumpet of God, the trumpet call of God. And in 1 Corinthians, this is referred to specifically as the last trumpet. And trumpets were used for many different reasons in the Old Testament. They signaled the start of the Jewish feasts and festivals. They would also give a, uh, they would blow a trumpet in times of war to warn the inhabitants of a city, or if there was ever to be an assembly or a gathering, they would blow a trumpet and people would gather together. And so this is going to be a very powerful trumpet blast. And soon as the trumpet is blown, there will be a gathering together of all God's people. And the last part of the plan, at least in these passages, is that we are caught up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus. And the Greek word for caught up is the Greek word harpazo, which means to snatch away. And years after the, 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 um, the Greek New Testament was written, the Romans, the Italians, translated the Greek New Testament into Latin. And the word that they used for caught up, 
not the Greek word harpazo, is the Latin word um, rapturo. And that's where the phrase, the rapture, comes from. It's the Latin translation of this Greek word. And if you've ever gone online or if you've ever done any studying, is there a difference between the rapture and the second coming? Some people say no, because the rapture is not in the Bible. Well, it's not in the Bible because the rapture is a Latin word. It's a translation of a Latin word. So for any of you that were wondering about that, that's, that's kind of the story behind that. And the word rapture, the reason why they used the word rapture, the, Latins, the, the, the Italians did, is because it's based on the Greek word for being caught up or snatched away. And this is dealing with the raptor class of birds, like eagles, owls. When they see a prey, they will sneak up on them, swoop down, and they will snatch or catch away their prey suddenly, violently, swiftly, and the prey doesn't even know what's going to take place. But they will be caught away. And that's the word that's used to describe this event. We won't know it's coming, like the exact moment. We're not going to know, and we will be caught away. So that's why this event is called the rapture. All right, there's five details. I want to know 500 details, don't you? Like, there, this isn't enough information I, I want to know. And so I'm going to share with you some of the things that go on in my mind. Some, not everything that goes on in my mind. And when I, when I read about this, I go, okay, this is exciting. Don't know what, what to expect, but this is going to be exciting. But in this passage, it says that there's three noises. The cry of command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet. And so, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but sorry for putting this thought in your mind. You're not going to get to sleep tonight. But I wonder, who's going to hear this? Are we going to hear this? Are we going to hear it audibly? Are we going to hear it internally? Will only believers hear this? Will all mankind hear this? And how quickly are these sounds going to be? Obviously, they're going to be sounding out when Jesus is descending, so they're not going to be like days apart. They're going to be pretty quick. But is there going to be one after the other, or is there going to be a couple seconds in between? And so this is kind of a daydream. I have this daydream, and I... Um, I hope I'm awake when this happens, and I hope I'm alive when this happens, but I kind of imagine that maybe I'm with a whole bunch of believers, maybe in a restaurant, and you, maybe you don't even know who the believers are, and all of a sudden we hear the cry of command. And I could just imagine believers looking around and going, what was that? Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard that. Did you hear that? And then right after that, the voice of the archangel, and at that point, the goosebumps are jumping out of your skin, and then we hear the trumpet. And then we realize, this is it. This is it. This event that God has promised for us, it's happening right now at this moment. And so we just say, hang on, we're about to go up. We're going to go up pretty quick. And so I, I think about those things. I think about those things. And it's fun to think about those things. We can't think about them all the time. But this event, it fills me with wonder and excitement and so many questions. There's so many more things that I want to know. But after it happens, then we'll know. We'll know the details and we'll discuss notes. Okay, we'll talk about that then. And you're sitting here and you're learning about this and this is maybe, maybe not the first time you've ever heard about this event. And I don't know what's going on in your mind right now. Some of you might be excited, okay? Some of you might be confused. <laughs> um, some of you might be uh, you know, asking more questions. And, and I realize some of you might be thinking, hey, what, what? What am I going to have for lunch? You know, I'm, I'm starting to get hungry. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, listen, we're reading this event. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't. But it will. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to experience this. This is going to happen. We're going to know what this is like. Someday we'll look back and say, remember when it happened? And we're going to be talking about this for all eternity. And this gives us hope. This gives us hope. So next week... Paul puts together a timeline of future events and we'll get into the day of the Lord, the tribulation, stuff like that. But the Thessalonians, they were told that they were in the tribulation and uh, well, I'll just, I'll leave that for next week. But next week, we'll look at those future events. Last week, um, we were in Michigan. We went to a, a different church and then I went home and I was watching our, our service online on, on YouTube and I, I heard Adam Skelly's sermon. He did a fantastic job. Um, talking about being salt and light in the world. And I love how he, he broke down what salt and light meant and all the different layers, and it was a great, great message. And it dawned on me as I was preparing this, knowing about this future event 
helps you and me truly be salt and light in this world. And specifically, because we do not grieve like the rest of mankind who does not have any hope. We have hope. Read that passage. This is why Paul gives them this hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. It says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, because they were grieving, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. When someone dies that's close to us, we grieve. That's it. We're not going to see them again in this life. But if you're a believer, we grieve, but we grieve with hope because we know that we will spend eternity with them. We will be reunited with them for, with Christ for eternity. And one thought that I had on this subject, the older I get and the more people that come in and out of my life, and you know, you, you go through that and people move and you have relationships and have you ever thought how each relationship that you've had with another human being has never gone as deep as you feel it should have gone? In other words, we will never have a relationship with another human being where we fully and completely and truly know that human being inside and out and that we are known deeply, fully, completely inside and out by another human being. We'll never, we'll never get there in this life some relationships more so than others. And you think about like spouses, you know, you get to know your spouse pretty well, but not fully, not completely. In fact, how many of us are still trying to figure ourselves out, right? You know, we, we're, we're, try, we're still trying to do this. But I, I read this passage in realizing that someday we're going to be in eternity with Christ in a glorified, resurrected body that is unpolluted by sin. And we're going to be there forever. So we will have relationships for eternity unlike we have in this life. Here we know in part, and sin has polluted our relationships, but then we will have eternity to know Jesus Christ fully and to be known by him. And also, we have unlimited time to get to know each other as well. So if you've ever experienced frustration in this life when it comes to relationships, that's every one of us, hopefully today, you can be filled with hope and anticipation that relationships are going to be like God intended them to be in the future after this event. So as we close this message, I think it's important to emphasize this is an event that's going to happen. And I'm excited about it. We don't know when it's going to happen. Maybe it'll happen in some of our lifetimes. We don't know. But this event is only the hope of people who have faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have this hope. And so do you have this hope? Do you have the hope of being cleansed from your sins because Jesus died for your sake, for your sins? And do you have the hope of resurrection because Jesus was raised from the dead? If you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, this is a free gift of salvation. It's not free to God. It cost him the, the life of his son. But for us, it's free. That's why it's grace. So if you've never done this, you can place your faith in Jesus Christ your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you can have this hope. And this is how we do this. Romans 10, 9, and 10, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So I make this offer available to anyone. The offer is good to everyone of all times. If you've never done this, why wouldn't you, why would you wait another minute? This is the free gift of eternal life and the hope of participating in every future event that God has planned for us. And all you need to do, you can say this between yourself and God right now. Just say, God, I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sins. And I believe that you raised him back to life. And I believe only through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ can I be saved. And so right now I put my faith in Jesus for my salvation. And if you said that, and you meant that, at any time in your life, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and the rapture is our hope. So let's pray and thank God for this hope that we have. Lord, thank you so much for this passage and other passages that I know we'll probably reference 
in, in the weeks to come. And this event, it's confusing because we've never seen anything like this before. We've never experienced anything like this before. But this is part of your plan. And there are reasons why you are taking the body of Christ out of earth, off of the earth, so you can fulfill the other promises that you have made. And Lord, I, and as we, we look into these things in the weeks to come, the one thing that it's supposed to do is change the way that we think about you, the way that we interact with you, and the way that we interact with our brothers and sisters in Christ and the world around us. This gives us hope. And when we see chaotic things happening in the world, we know what the future holds. We know the hope that we have because of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished and what he will accomplish. So today we just, we firmly set our minds and our emotions on your true unchanging word. Thank you for giving us this direction. Thank you for giving us this hope. And may we be the salt and light that you have called us to be so that others may see this hope as well. Again, we continue to pray for those that are going up to camp. We're excited for them to return next Sunday and get as much energy out of these kids that we can and enjoy that and hear what they have learned. But until then, Lord, um, thank you. We love you. And thank you for the future that you promised for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And let's close with a benediction from 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 12 and 13. It says, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen? Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great week.